Um, we were teaching through Second Peter in Sunday school, just finished this week and go back to Brad's turn to teach. Um, so let's turn to Second Peter chapter 3 and I'll show you where I got the inspiration from. Now because of the importance of these things, I've given you each a handout and I'm going to have a PowerPoint slide because it's important. So you've got three things to help you learn these five things. You've got your hearing, your seeing on the screen, and you're writing it down because these are very important things. So let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2, chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 8 is where I launched from into this study. So it says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So the phrase, be not ignorant of this one thing. As I was studying, I, re- I went, you know, I'm sure I've heard someone else say that, be not ignorant. So I went on a rabbit trail and looked up all the other verses that use this phrase, be not ignorant, and came across these five things, including this one in Second Peter, that we'll study tonight. So things that we need to know. So things not to be ignorant of, or things that you need to know, things that will help us understand. So in 2 Peter here, where we'll start, we see that time means nothing to God. So in your handout, there's a blank. So it's up to you whether you want to listen now and write in later, however you want to cope, because we we won't go too far verse-wise, We'll stick pretty much in the passage, but we'll have a look at some other cross-references. So time means nothing to God. That's the first thing that we need to know that we shouldn't be ignorant of. So in the verse in 2 Peter, it says that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So after a thousand years is gone, to God it's just like a day. And the equivalent is true. After a day is gone, it's like a thousand years. Time means nothing to God. And a confirming passage is in Psalm. Psalms chapter 90. And verse 4. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past and a watch in the night. So a thousand years, just like yesterday, or even just like a watch in the night, three hours. Means nothing. Time means nothing. And it's important in the context of Second Peter because of the scoffers in verse 3. The scoffers shall come saying, where is the promise of his coming? So they were scoffing at the promise of his coming. But Peter says, don't be ignorant of the fact that Time means nothing to God. When he makes a promise, he will fulfill it when he's ready. So God is outside of time in verse 8. But then we can see why we think he's taking a long time in verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God's long-suffering causes the delay, what we count of as a delay. It's been 2,000 years since Christ came and died for us. He said, as I go, I will come back. Why is it taking so long? Because of his long-suffering. And in Sunday school, we took that little sidetrack and looked at God's long suffering, his willingness that no one should perish. Um, and one verse we'll look at is First Timothy, which is just before the Hebrews. First Timothy two, verse four. Who, that's God our Savior, will have all men to be saved and come and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So. Seeing other people saved is why God waits. So in 
go back to 2 Peter, and in verse 10, we see that he will come, but it will be in his time. So verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. The Lord will come. He's made a promise. He will come. Time is not important to him. In fact, he's outside of time. And if, in fact, he's governed more by his long-suffering, his mercy, to see other people saved. Now, as always, there's an application. So if you read verse 11, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the element shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And then verse 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. So we need to know that God's outside of time. What should we do? Because we know that. We should continue to behave. There's the little phrase I've coined there. We need to continue to behave. So what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conversation and godliness? And there's many other passages that talk about how we should live godly because God is coming, because Christ is coming. Okay, so the first thing we need to know, time means nothing to God. Secondly, The dead in Christ are with Christ. The second thing we need to know that we shouldn't be ignorant of, the dead in Christ are with Christ. Go over to 1 Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 has the phrase, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those that have died, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So we shouldn't be ignorant about those who have died. And he goes on to say um, in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So if God's going to bring the dead with him when Jesus comes, he's already with them. So the dead in Christ are with Christ. We know this because of the resurrection. So the first sub point there, the resurrection gives hope. In verse 14. If we believe, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we can know that those who have died, Jesus will bring with him. So the resurrection gives hope. Then verse 15 explains that we aren't in the way. It says, we shall not prevent them, verse 15. This we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So we're not in the way. Um, We won't precede them either. The word prevent can also mean proceed. And the next verse goes on to say, dead in Christ rise first. So we, we go up after them. They have a head start. So the resurrection gives us hope. We aren't in the way. Verse 16 tells us their bodies will be raised first. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we will be changed, in verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And verse 18 gives us our application. It also goes back to um, verse 13, the application, wherefore comfort one another with these words. And in verse 13, it says, I need you to know this, that you don't sorrow. 
So the dead in Christ are with Christ. Therefore, we can comfort one another. We don't have to worry about those who've died. Okay, so you've got the blanks. Come on, guys, keep up. The dead are with Christ. Keep clicking. There we go. Keep clicking. That's the main point. Think time means nothing to God. The dead are with Christ. First Thessalonians. Right. Stop there. First Thessalonians 4. The resurrection gives hope. We aren't in the way. Their bodies will raise first and then we will be changed. Wherefore, comfort one another. Okay, next one. Okay, spiritual gifts are for everyone. So Brad nearly stole my thunder on this one Wednesday night. <laughs> I was sitting there going, don't you? <laughs> spiritual gifts are for everyone. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 1 gives us our key phrase. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. So we shouldn't be ignorant about spiritual gifts. It's very important that we understand them. So let's read verses 1 through 4. And the first blank, they will honour Jesus Christ. So the first thing we need to know about spiritual gifts is that will honour Jesus Christ. Verses 1 through 3. We shouldn't be ignorant. Verse 2. Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. So the Corinthians grew up in a climate of idolatry, idol worship, spirit worship. And he wanted to make sure they understood that this spiritual gift was different to what they saw in the idol temples. And the main difference is that the Spirit of God will never curse Jesus and a person can't say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Ghost. It's a test of your salvation. Who's Jesus to you? If it doesn't come back, Jesus is the Christ of the Son of the living God, like Peter, then you've got to go, question mark, because is the Spirit in you? Okay, So let's have a look at a cross-reference on that one. Uh, go over to 1 John. First John chapter 4. We'll read 1 through 3. But beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. So in verse 1 it says, try the spirits. Verse 2 tells you what that test is. Hereby we know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is, in, is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. So when you try the spirits, the question is, who's Jesus Christ? And if they can't say Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, who came in the flesh, then they're not of God. They're not God's spirit. They're not speaking with God's spirit. It's a simple test. So the spiritual gifts are for everyone. The spiritual gifts will honour Jesus Christ. So this rubbish that's going on in some of the churches that's not honouring Christ, straightforward, simple, not of God's spirit. It's not, it's not a hard test. Second point, there is only one source 
of these spiritual gifts. So going back to Second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, our main passage, verses 4 through 6. Now there are diversities of gifts, lots of different gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but is the same God who worketh all in all. So lots of different things, but there's only one source, and that's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Then we see in verse 7 and also verse 11, that everyone gets a gift. So in verse 7, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And then also verse 11, But all these things worketh that one and selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So it's the spiritual gifts is for everyone. Everybody gets at least one. Then we see in verse 7 also that they are not for yourself. And Brad looked at that on Wednesday night. In the end of verse 7 it says they are given to profit with all. To profit everybody. For edification of everybody. And when you look at the next few chapters of Corinthians where he talks about the misuse of the spiritual gifts... It's one of the things he, he emphasizes. Does it edify? Sure, you can speak in tongues. You're allowed to speak in tongues at Corinthians at the time of the New Testament. But does it edify? It's always a good test. So the spiritual gifts are not for yourself. It's for the church, for the body. Um, go over to, as a cross-reference to 1 Peter <coughs> chapter 4. First Peter 4.10 As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. So there's the challenge there. You have, you have these gifts, do it as God gives you the ability and make sure God gets the glory. Then the next point, we are not all the same. These spiritual gifts that we get, we're not all the same. We don't all have the same gift. And even if we do both have the, teach, the gift of teaching, it will be a different kind of gift. We're different. So um, we read in verse 11, where he divided to every man severally as he will. So he divides it up, splits it up, gives strengths to certain people, and those same strengths he doesn't give to others. He gives them a slightly different strength. So we're not all the same. And the parallel passage in Romans 12, verse 6, mentions that too. Chapter 12, not chapter 6, Romans 12. Romans 12, 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. And then he goes on to, exp to explain those gifts. So we have gifts that are differing according to the grace that's given us. So we're not all the same. So it's important we understand spiritual gifts. They will honour Jesus Christ. There's only one source, and that's the Holy Spirit. Everybody gets at least one. They are never for self-aggrandizement. They're always to edify others. And we are not all the same. What's the application? Therefore, go down to verse 26 in 1 Corinthians 12, 25 and 26. So, in the, the paragraph leading up to this, he's talking about the body and the making the application of members caring one for another. 
um, and verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. For one member, or one member be honoured, all the members rejoice with it. So the application of about knowing about spiritual gifts is that we care for one another. There should be no schism, no division, but we should care for each other. Okay, next one. Getting through these really fast. I thought I might. This one's a whole chapter. So let's go to Romans chapter 11. This is an important truth to get your head around. Paul thinks so because he spends a whole chapter, a whole 36 verses telling us about it. Verse 25 is where we find that key phrase about not being ignorant. Romans 11:25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So the truth is that we need to be aware of is Israel is set aside, but not forsaken. So we see there that um, blindness in part has happened to Israel. They've been set aside, they're not forsaken, God's not finished with them yet. And the whole chapter talks about that. So let's have a look at a few points that he makes. So going back to the beginning of the chapter, Romans 11, verses 1 and 2. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel? And then that actually starts the next point. So in that first part, God has not cast away his people. There's been blindness. They've been set aside. He's working with the church, but he's not finished with them yet. He's not cast them away. Then the illustration that starts in verse 2, when Elias was praying, this is after he gets persecuted and runs away from Jezebel. And he says, I'm the only one left. Verse 3, um, this is Isaiah's prayer, Elias's prayer. Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what was the answer of God in verse 4? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. There's always a remnant. God will judge his people, but there's always a remnant who remain faithful. It's the same with Israel. He's not working with them as a nation right now, but there, there is that remnant that's ready, waiting for the Messiah still. And there's also that remnant that's been saved and added to the church. So God's not finished with Israel yet. So in verse 5, he uses that word. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Uh, how does that work? <laughs> election of grace. Everybody's definition of election is you're chosen. But grace is mentioned here. So maybe we don't understand election properly. Just thoughts. So there is always a remnant. Now remember, they're set aside for a time and God will pick them up again. So we see that in verse 25 where we looked at the key verse. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Okay, so it's only for a time, but he will go back to them. So we need to know that Israel has been set aside. Then there's these therefores, and you, I don't have time to read the whole chapter. It's a big Bible study in its own self. But let's have a look at a couple of these, these therefores. Be, considering that Israel's been set aside, what should we do? 
Now, I've used a fancy word in the first one after the first therefore is condescend. It, in the biblical definition, that means to be willing to lower oneself to another's level, to another's level. So to be gracious toward them. So let's have a look at a few verses. So Romans 11, verse 11 and 12. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So it's in the middle of a big argument about because Israel was set aside, we the Gentiles were able to experience this salvation by grace through faith. They were set aside, we get the blessing. How much greater would it be if they were blessed? What would we get? And that's the, the illustration he's using. So then the challenge is in verse 18. And again, he's in the middle of argument. He's talking about the branches, how Israel was cut off and we were grafted in, in, its, in their place. So again, Israel was cut off. We got the blessing. We were grafted in. Verse 18. Um, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. And that's where I get that thought. Be not high-minded. Yes, Israel have been set aside because of their unbelief, but that's no excuse for us to get proud. We need to remember that God started with Israel. Jesus, our Saviour, was a Jew. Don't despise them. Don't write them off. God's not finished yet. He's working with the church now, but Israel is still Israel, and he's going to go back. Then the second, therefore, is to consider we can marvel at God's goodness. Uh, verse 22. Romans eleven twenty-two. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward you, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And there's, there's that challenge again about being high-minded. So we can marvel at, we consider God's goodness. He was severe to Israel, but he's good to us. Then also verse 33. <coughs> oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counsellor, or who has first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. So Israel set aside. We need to be not high-minded, but <coughs> condescend to Israel, to be gracious to them. Then we can consider God's, God's goodness towards us in allowing us to experience that salvation by grace. Okay, and then the last one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This one was a tricky one to summarize. So verse 1 gives us the thought. 1 Corinthians 10, 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And it goes on to explain a bit more. So we shouldn't be ignorant that everybody went through the same thing. Which is why I've, I've put... Experience doesn't make salvation. That's the point I think that Paul's trying to make. Experiences don't make salvation. So let's read 1 through 4 and then verse 5 to give us the, the, the whole thought. So 1 through 4, so we, we read verse 1. 
They all went under the cloud, they passed through the sea, uh, verse 2, and they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So everybody that came out of Egypt went through all those same experiences. Verse 5, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So shared experiences doesn't make salvation. Like Pastor said this morning, God doesn't have grandchildren or nieces and nephews. He has children, your personal salvation experience. And it was the same with Israel. Israel illustrated that. They all went through the same thing. They were all delivered, but not everyone responded in faith. Some of them responded with grumbling and moaning and rebellion. And it's the same in, in a household. I'm one of six children. Two, two of us don't go to church every Sunday. But while we grew up, every single Sunday, every service, we were in church. It doesn't guarantee that you'll walk with the Lord if you were raised in a Christian home. You have to decide yourself. So experience doesn't make salvation. What should we do about it? Um, so verse 6 through 11. Now, I've, because I wanted to see word, I found circumvent. Keep going. Therefore, circumvent. Or Then I, on the drive here, I went, oh, should have thought circumspect. Walk circumspectly. So let's read verse 6 through 11, where he talks, us, talks to be circumvent, so to be careful. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. Now, these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust, lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drank and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now the, all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So there's a list of things there we should be aware of, and we should avoid, because we remember that experiences doesn't make salvation. And we see lust, idolatry, fornication, tempting Christ, murmuring. Some key sins that we can be aware of and know that they can be besetting sins to believers. Because these Israelites, they saw the Red Sea part. They walked through the Red Sea on either side, probably saw the fish swimming around on the inside. They saw God provide water. They saw God cure the water from bitter to sweet. They saw God come down on the mount. They heard God speak. And yet some of them didn't believe. All we have is the Bible. We didn't get to experience all of that. So we need to believe it just like they did. It's the same accountability. We need to believe and be careful of those sins that Israel walked into because they refused to believe. But then we can also see in verse 12 and 13 that we can claim God's promise about escaping temptation. Verses 12 through 13, common verse. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Okay, so we can claim that promise, we can take up God's escape route. 
so that when we're tempted, we don't fall into those list of sins that we're given there, lust, idolatry, adultery, all those murmurings. So there we go. Five things we must know. Five things we need to know that Paul and Peter wanted us to know. I think they're given to help us understand things. So time means nothing to God. That helps us understand how come he's not here yet. Time means nothing. His long suffering means everything to him. Then the dead in Christ are with Christ. We don't have to sorrow about those who've died. He, they are with him and he will bring them with him when he comes. Because he is coming and we can comfort one another. Then we need to remember about spiritual gifts. They are for everyone. They will honour Christ. And they are for edifying the body. Therefore we can use those spiritual gifts to care for one another. Then we need to know that Israel is only set aside, not forsaken, not cast away, but just set aside. Um, therefore, don't despise them. Um, don't get high-minded and think we're better than Israel. No, we're not. We need to believe in, just like they needed to believe. And God will judge us the same as, they, as he judged Israel. So we can, we can consider God's goodness towards us and allowing us to experience salvation. Um, and then remember that shared experiences don't, doesn't make salvation. Everybody is personally accountable to belief. Um, so be careful once you are saved to be careful of those sins that Israel fell into and claim God's promise of being able to escape those temptations. Okay, I've picked a song to sing. Um, it is, we're going to sing it as well, but we're going to sing verse 4, 5 and 6. Verse 4 and 5 aren't in the hymn book. Uh, verse 4, 5, and 6 talk about the second coming. Um, so we'll start at verse 4, and it talks about desiring the Lord's coming. And then we get to verse 6, which is our common verse 4, which we'll know really well. But I thought since we started with that, time means nothing, the second coming will happen. Let's sing about the second coming. <laughs> 